So good morning and thanks to everyone who is here this morning. My name is Alison McGuire and I'm the Program Manager of National Security and Human Rights at Progressive Congress. Um, we, uh, Progressive Congress is a nonprofit organization that serves as a conduit between progressive ideas both on and off the hill. Um, so in our program on national security and human rights, we look at alternative approaches to current policies. And one of these approaches uh, is at the core of a new way forward, uh, rethinking US strategy in Afghanistan. If you haven't picked up a report already, go ahead and grab one. The report was created by the Afghanistan Study Group, and it, it outlines five key elements to a new strategy in the nine-year conflict. The study group is comprised of public policy practitioners, former U.S. government officials, academics, and policy activists concerned with the Obama administration's uh, policy course in Afghanistan, and to a more limited degree, Pakistan. Um, we have three uh, wonderful panelists today, and um, starting to my right is Matthew Ho, the director of the Afghanistan Study Group. He served as a former Marine in Iraq and was a State Department official in Afghanistan. Uh, Paul Pilar is the Director of Graduate Studies in the Center for Peace and Security Studies at Georgetown University. He worked for 28 years in the intelligence community. And a retired officer of the US Army Reserve, he will be lending an academic voice to today's discussion. Darcy Berner is the Executive Director of Progressive Congress. In 2008, she co-authored the Responsible Plan to End the War in Iraq, a report detailing the non-military solution for America's goals in Iraq. Um, the briefing will be taped during this initial portion. I have a few questions that I'll start out with, and then um, it will be off the record, and, and the video camera will go away for when I open it up to the audience. So um, just starting out, Matt, uh, despite my short description of the Afghanistan study group, can you elaborate on its, purposes, um, its purpose and goals and how the group actually came about? Sure. Um, thanks for having me here today. Uh, appreciate you guys being here this morning on a recess day and it's raining and everything else, so I appreciate you all turning out for this. Um, the Afghanistan Study Group came about last November. Um, it's more of a network than it is any organization. Uh, we have currently about 60 signers. We, we, get, we get one or two or three signers uh, a week adding to their name for our report. In addition, we've probably had about 25 or 30 other individuals uh, lend their expertise to the report in terms of help develop it. Uh, and they, they subsequently chose not to sign for a variety of reasons, some institutional, some uh, for a variety of reasons. Uh, the uh, report is a consensus report. Um, it's, you know, as you can imagine, getting 60 or so Samad people to, to agree on something as complex as Afghanistan. Uh, it's difficult. Um, so what we looked at doing was, was trying to get trying to, to understand Afghanistan from the U.S. foreign policy perspective, uh, evaluating not just where we're at in Afghanistan, but why we're in Afghanistan, and then recommending uh, a strategy based upon what we see as our vital interests. So when we take a step back and we look at Afghanistan, we look and we see it in the region as well. We look and we see there are two vital interests for the United States in that part of the world. One is Al-Qaeda and similar transnational terror groups, and the other is uh, the stability of Pakistan, uh, specifically the safeguarding of uh, their nuclear arsenal. Uh, so as we look at that, as we, we understand those two vital interests, we then take a look at, from the top-down perspective, how do you better develop U.S. policy so that we're actually trying to achieve those goals? And what should we be doing in Afghanistan to achieve that policy as opposed to just continuing to allocate resources greater than what we did the year before? So trying to go for much more of a top-down approach than from a bottom-up approach. Many of us have been critical of the administration's strategy in Afghanistan because it seems to have developed from the bottom up. This is what we did last year. We're reacting to the events on the ground because it didn't go well in Kandahar. We're going to add more troops this year rather than, hey, what are our vital interests in the region, Al-Qaeda and the stability of Pakistan? How do we pursue that? So as I said, we're more of a network. We have uh, members throughout the country. Uh, whether they be uh, in academia, whether they be retired military or government officials, uh, whether they be in the development community, whether they be writers or journalists, uh, many of them have a significant uh, Afghanistan or regional expertise. And so the goals over the next uh, few months are basically to uh, help educate uh, uh, both in Washington, D.C. and outside the Beltway 
on the situation in Afghanistan, on what we believe to be our strategic uh, vital interests in that part of the world uh, to help influence the debate. And then as we move forward, to build this foundation of uh, individuals and organizations, both again in D.C. and outside the Beltway, who will advocate for a change in uh, our Afghanistan strategy. Um, what we're looking to do is, is continue to build this foundation to give the president, basically, the political support he needs to adopt a alternative strategy in Afghanistan that's more in line with what our vital interests are. So uh, I'll turn it back over to you, Austin. Um, just a more generic question for all of you. Um, what are some of the political realities of implementing the changes that you suggest in this report, and how will the public perceive these changes? You know, I, I was uh, introduced as uh, lending an <coughs> academic perspective, so let me uh, reference some academic research that I think is, is pertinent to the question. Uh, research by Christopher Gelby and some others that talks about what is the American public's tolerance for casualties in war? And what influences um, uh, the degree of tolerance? We're talking about a military expedition that has now just entered its 10th year. Um, the main criteria in the academics tell us for uh, whether the American public tolerates costs and casualties warfare is whether they see the United States as being on a winning track and or, uh, has a trajectory that will bring success. There are enough of the indications um, of the trajectory we're on in Afghanistan, not least of all from the standpoint of the American public, a trajectory of increased causes and casualties uh, that is not, I think, very encouraging from the standpoint of public support for continuing the current course. One of the themes that one often hears, and I just heard it yesterday from Fred Kagan, who was one of the smartest and, and most articulate proponents of the current counterinsurgency, indeed one of the architects of it, is, uh, well, don't, tell, don't talk to us about nine years or ten years, because after all, the, the strategy that we've got going now has only been, is only just getting underway. General Petraeus, uh, before in General McChrystal and implementing counterinsurgency, really only got it started within the last couple of years. We were kind of fumbling around those first few years. I don't think the American public, as a political reality, uh, is going to get too much into those uh, finer points about when we stop one strategy and when we start another. Uh, they're more concerned about how long is this war going on, how much longer is it going on, and what are the costs and capital. So I think the main uh, political reality here is um, uh, that there has to be a way for the administration and the Congress to find a change in trajectory. One that is not seen as a cutting and running, one that is not seen as uh, opening up the United States and Americans to uh, any new serious uh, uh, security threats that we don't already face, but one that will bring the cost in line with what we are actually achieving. Um, there was a saying my dad used to use a lot when I was growing up, which was, uh, it doesn't matter how fast you climb the ladder if you've leaned it against the wrong wall. Uh, the problem that we have uh, in Afghanistan with the current strategy is largely that we've been approaching it uh, with the ladder leaning against the wrong wall. Uh, or at least so it seems based on the kinds of results that we've gotten, and that was the conclusion that the study group largely came to. Um, that's also, frankly, the conclusion that most of the American public has come to, that what we're doing isn't working, and we need to try something different. We're spending $100 billion a year on our military presence in a country whose gross domestic product is $14 billion a year, and that includes the aid that makes no sense. And most of the American public, when they hear those numbers, are, you know, most of the people I've talked to, most of the people I know of who've heard those numbers, are shocked. Um, now, obviously the U.S. does have some uh, legitimate strategic interest in Afghanistan in ensuring that we don't 
uh, contribute to further destabilization of the Middle East, particularly with the tensions between Pakistan and India. And there are regional issues. And there are humanitarian obligations that we have relative to the people of Afghanistan. But I think that the political reality is that the American people have been looking for some alternative to the current course. And based on what we've seen in things like Bob Woodward's new book, our president has been looking for an alternative to the current course and wasn't offered one. Um, so the study group was designed to provide at least a broad set of principles outlining a different approach to solving the real problem in Afghanistan. 